As World War II entered its final years, since 1939, the world had been caught up in one of the most devastating and brutal conflicts it had ever known. But by late 1943 and into 1944, the tide in Europe had begun to change. Pockets of resistance began forming in France. Danger was a constant and many executed if captured. From out of their hiding places underground and burned out buildings, the French resistance, both men and women, would infiltrate the German high command, befriend the troops on the ground and radio back the intel received, including German troop movements and locations of weapon stockpiles. Realizing how crucial this information was to our war efforts, a plan to aid the French resistance had to be put into place. In August of 1943, several squadrons would be selected from the anti-submarine bomber groups patrolling off the coast of the United States eastern seaboard, flying heavy B-24 Liberators. These hand-picked pilots and crews deployed overseas to England and worked together with England's Royal Air Force to give aid to the French resistance and compose one of the most important and dangerous air missions of World War II, eventually becoming known by the code name Operation Carpetbagger. In the spring of 1942, World War II was decimating the European countryside. However, the eastern coastline of the United States had been on high alert after several sightings and attacks on Allied shipping by the deadly German submarine known as the U-Boat. Since Germany had managed to park their submarines so close to American beaches and had been doing this since 1942 or possibly earlier, Air Force and Army air bases began to spring up along the eastern seaboard, from Miami's 36th Street Airport to Chatham Field in Savannah, Georgia, up to Dow Field in Maine. All these states began anti-submarine squadrons and sent heavy bombers known as B-24 Liberators and other aircraft out to sea to patrol the coastline. Along with the Navy, who were simultaneously conducting their own patrols, even the Gulf of Mexico had its own airfields guarding the coastline from outposts like Galveston, Gulfport, and Drew Field in Tampa, Florida. From January 1942 to 1943, German U-boats wreaked havoc, specifically off of the coast of North Carolina, in the areas of Cape Hatteras and Ocracoke Island known as the Outer Banks. On January 19, 1942, a German U-boat sank the 337-foot U.S. freighter, the city of Atlanta, sinking the ship and killing all but three of the 47 men aboard. The same U-boat attacked two more ships just hours later. As for the German war vessel, this classification of it being strictly a submarine was not entirely accurate. Actually, the U-boat was more of a warship that could dive and remain underwater for short periods of time and could only travel approximately 60 miles before having to resurface for air. They often attack ships while on the surface with deck-mounted guns. However, they were equally capable 
to destroy ships from below water level. These German war vessels were considered by experts to be some of the best warships ever designed. But as the threat from the Germans increased, so did the preparation and retaliation by the United States, as their defense systems were quickly strengthened. On April 14, 1942, the first German U-boat caught by the American Navy in U.S. waters was sunk 16 miles southeast of Nags Head, North Carolina. Within the next couple of months, three more U-boats were sunk all along the North Carolina coast, bringing a total of four U-boats destroyed and representing the most enemy kills of any state. All in all, over the next six months, 397 ships had been sunk or damaged and more than 5,000 people killed. Even though these battles happened in the Gulf of Mexico and along the eastern state's coastline, off the coast of North Carolina, near Cape Hatteras, saw the most enemy activity and sightings, giving this the area nickname Torpedo Junction. And although this was going on just a few miles off our American shore, the government kept this information classified as not to disturb the American public. To this day, a German submarine lies just 10 miles off the coast of Wilmington, North Carolina, in 120 feet of water. And a cold steel watery grave holds the bodies of those lost German soldiers floating silently inside sealed hatches. So ask anyone who lived near the Outer Banks of North Carolina. They would be the first to tell you how close the United States came to being overrun by Germany in World War II and had basically parked right in our backyard to the point of having their homes and communities labeled with the frightening nickname, Torpedo Junction. All of this proves to be a constant reminder of how close Hitler's reach came to American soil, specifically the North Carolina coast. Before all this Atlantic wartime activity started, and before 1939, when Hitler began putting his master plan of Germany reclaiming the glory they had lost in World War I, in a small town known as Tichy, North Carolina, a young man in his 20s named Henry D. McMillan Jr. was living his life in the 1930s. Growing up, his family meant everything to him. He was very close to his mother, Louise Bland McMillan, and his hardworking father, Henry McMillan Sr. They lived in a small but comfortable home and church was an important part of their life. I'm sure Henry D. McMillan was rocked in this chair many times as an infant. His father, Dude McMillan, bought it for Henry D.'s mother, Lou Bland McMillan, around 1900. And you'll notice behind me the picture of Teachy Presbyterian Church, which is still standing in Teachy. Henry D.'s grandfather, Abram Francis Bland, became a contractor in Duplin County when he returned after the Civil War, and he helped build the church. Henry D.'s grandfather also built the grocery store in Teachy in 1908 for his son, H.D. McMillan, better known as Dude, and his sons ran. Even as a young boy, he had an inclination for the military, and no matter what he did, he was always the center of attention. In a small town like Tichy, there wasn't much to do, but he was always looking for adventure in some form or another. He discovered he could make good money in the thriving jukebox business by buying, selling, and servicing them in local diners and dance halls throughout the area. And that's what Henry would do for the next five years or so. But even though he was a hard worker, he was always on the lookout for girls. And one day while installing a jukebox in one of the small local community houses in a town called Warsaw, not far from his town of Tichy, he spotted a girl that immediately caught his eye, and Henry caught her eye as well. Her name was Rachel, and they hit it off immediately. And when they weren't together, they would write each other constantly. Dearest Henry D., 
I suppose you will be the least bit surprised to hear from me, but I've been thinking about you quite a bit today and finally decided to write. Did you or have you gotten a card about the dance? I hope you can come. We were, well, Alice, Richard, and I, still planning to go see you real soon. Richard wants to let us go fishing and maybe we'll go. Friday? Maybe? Be good till I see you. I love you, Rachel. And as the letters continued, so did the relationship. Henry thought he had finally found the one girl that would settle him down. But it wouldn't be long before Henry's old habits would get in the way. He was athletic, handsome, and having his pick of any of the young ladies in the area was never a problem. Before he met Rachel, he used to boast to his friends, why just make one girl happy when I can make them all happy? And it was this attitude that would always come back to haunt him, especially in a serious relationship, like the one he was involved with now. When we were kids, me and my brother were in Tichy at the Macmillan home, and we went exploring, and we happened to wander in this room and found an old footlocker and some other stuff that belonged to Henry D. And we found his old cowboy boots and his dog tags. They gave those boots to my brother Jimmy, and that really made his day. Well, you know, we wanted to know more about Henry D. And they told us that he was very adventurous, very outgoing, and he had a great personality. When the war broke out, they said that he wanted to do his part, so he went and joined the Army Air Corps. Oh, another thing, they said Henry D. always had a lot of girlfriends. Henry D.'s reputation with the girls and the rumors that would fly around town would eventually make their way back to Rachel in Warsaw, North Carolina, which was not far away and news traveled fast. She had finally had enough of Henry D.'s so-called adventures and called it quits on their relationship. And even though it would be several years before Japan would rain down its infamous attack on Pearl Harbor, sending all our young men to war, Rachel sent what would probably be as close to a Dear John letter that Henry D. would ever receive, even though he was several years away from enlistment in the Army Air Corps. Henry D., I suppose you will be both surprised and annoyed at hearing from me. However, I grant you'll not be bothered with a letter. Just a note to let you know that I want my ring. I thought you'd at least be decent enough to send it back. Will you please send it? Either today or tomorrow? Because I'm going to the lake and I want it before I leave Sunday. I hear it's quite a habit with you taking rings. Maybe you're a hoarder? If so, I suggest you try the dime store. Just Rachel. So for the next few years, Henry D. carried on as normal getting the most out of his life as he could. But just like always, that adventurous spirit of Henry D's would finally pull him in the direction of no return. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. During this infamous attack on Pearl Harbor, a family friend, Raphael Sims IV, great-grandson of the Civil War hero, Admiral Raphael Sims, who commanded the CSS Alabama, was one of the few that were able to get airborne. And, in his case, it was off the deck of the cruiser, the USS St. Louis. His family stated that Pilot Sims IV was almost shot down by friendly fire several times during the fight. Ironically, later during World War II, like his great-grandfather Admiral Sims, Pilot Sims IV also served on a warship with the same Alabama namesake, the battleship USS Alabama. With World War II raging in Europe, and now, after Pearl Harbor, America was thick in the fight as well. And Henry D. always said, everyone else will be coming home with all these great war stories. I don't want to be left behind. So with that, he closed up shop, packed up, 
said his goodbyes to his family and friends, and set a course to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. When Henry D. went to join the Army Air Corps, they asked him about the scars on his legs. They, of course, came from when his legs were broken. He and his friends jumped on a freight train, and one of the boys fell, and he was about to get hurt by the closing of the door. Uncle Henry D. shoved him out of the way, and in doing so, the door shut on Uncle Henry D.'s legs and broke them both. Saving his friend from certain death on a train boxcar. So to avoid any complications about his injuries, he told them they were just birthmarks. He enlisted in the Army Air Corps on August 6, 1942. From there, he was sent to Harlingen Aerial Gunnery School in Harlingen, Texas. This was an intense six-week training program in both air-to-air -air and surface-to-air gunnery. The aircraft used in these exercises ranged from heavy bombers, like the B-17 Flying Fortress and the B-24 Liberator, and fighters, like the P-63 King Cobra, the AT-6 Texan, and BT-13 Valiants. Within a few months, Henry D. McMillan Jr. graduated as an aerial gunner on October 21, 1942, and was also promoted to sergeant on his graduation. Not long after this, on the West Coast, one of the most important military figures to come out of World War II, Clifford Heflin, who had been stationed in California, along with Major Robert Fish, and in command of the 46th Anti-Submarine Squadron, was making preparations to move his units to the East Coast. The 46th flew into Cherry Point Marine Station in North Carolina in March 1943. They eventually began changing aircraft and training in the B-24 Liberator due to its long-range capabilities and firepower, which was much more suited to submarine warfare. Also, a general order was issued by headquarters to change the 46th to the 22nd Anti-Submarine Squadron, Heavy. And immediately after that, they were moved to Bluthenthal Airfield in Wilmington, North Carolina. Around that same time, Henry D. McMillan Jr. also arrived at the Cherry Point Air Base to join up with the 25th Anti-Submarine Wing and assigned to the 22nd Anti-Submarine Squadron under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Heflin. The next few months at Bluthenthal Airfield, Henry D. was involved in final training and submarine patrol missions off of the coast of North Carolina, specifically the Outer Banks, better known as Torpedo Junction, and had obtained that nickname from all the German U-boat activity in that region of the Atlantic and the devastation to Allied shipping those submarines caused there. Henry D. McMillan, or Mac, as he was known to his commanders and friends, was attached to pilot Lieutenant Wilmer Staple's crew as a waste gunner, an engineer in the B-24 Liberator. My dad, Lieutenant Wilmer L. Staple, was a highly decorated pilot. He began his career in World War II flying the bombers. What I remember the most about my dad's war stories from his original crew back in 1942. My dad always talked about Henry D. McMillan Jr. What a fine, great young man he was. And he was always one of my dad's top notch crew members. And they were flying the B-24 Liberator. Mac also trained occasionally at Camp Davis, which was like Harlingen, was an air gunnery school and less than 20 miles from Wilmington. The area surrounding Camp Davis had been an old Civil War fort known as Fort Fisher and provided a perfect area for gunnery practice. And ironically, Henry D's grandfather, Abram Francis Bland, 
was also stationed at Fort Fisher during the Civil War as a member of the 1st Regiment North Carolina Artillery Division. The closest town to Camp Davis was Holly Ridge, and the crew used to joke about the town being so small, and in a humorous play on words, called it a boom town. Boom, you're in, boom, you're out. But most of Mac's time was spent at Bluthenthal throughout 1943 in submarine patrol missions. But orders came down that Heflin was to choose 12 crews from the 25th Anti-Submarine Wing. Specifically, the 4th Anti-Submarine Squadron based out of Langley Field, Virginia, and the 22nd out of Bluthenthal, and prepare them to move overseas, where they would eventually land at the U.S. Army Air Base in Dunkswell, England. Mac was now getting ready to taste the real battle he was looking for, with a chance to fly off the coast of Europe and face Hitler's war machine firsthand. And that adventurous spirit that it drove Henry D. McMillan Jr. to enlist, climb to the rank of sergeant and be handpicked as one of the 12 crews flying overseas with Lieutenant Colonel Heflin and Major Robert Fish and two others who would later become leaders, Major Rodman A. St. Clair and Major Robert Boone was about to be severely tested against the bulk of the German U-boat fleet in the Bay of Biscay and from the air by Hitler's seasoned Luftwaffe fighter pilots. In August of 1943, Henry D. McMillan and his 22nd anti-submarine squadron deployed to Dunkswell, England to fly German U-boat patrols over the Bay of Biscay. Once there, Henry D. knew this action would be far more intense and dangerous than any missions he had flown back in Wilmington, North Carolina. Not only did they have to contend with more of a concentration of German U-boats, there was also the constant threat from the German Luftwaffe, providing cover from the skies. Through all of this heavy enemy action, while Sergeant Henry D. McMillan was patrolling the Bay of Biscay, he was still flying with the same crew that had been together since early 1943 at Bluthenthal Airfield, Wilmington, North Carolina. Wilmer Staple Crew, where Henry D. worked as a waste gunner, engineer, and occasionally a dispatcher, and still part of the 22nd Anti-Submarine Squadron. He was flying several patrol missions a month and also encountered heavy enemy activity. I listened to a lot of my dad's war stories, everything from his missions in the States to his overseas missions in England and Germany. Some of the things I remember the most were all the amazing amounts of medals that my dad received. One of the most distinguished awards and medals was the Distinguished Flying Cross Medal. His whole career, he did nothing but fly, and he did retire in 1960. It wasn't long after this that things started to change at Dunkswell for Henry D., his crew, and the rest of the anti-submarine squadrons. Rumors started circulating about possible reassignments and maybe even moving to other air bases in England. No one could be sure, but change was definitely on the horizon. As the end of October 1943 approached, those rumors were verified as fact. On October 19, 1943, as noted in Henry D. McMillan's flight log, he flew one more 13-hour anti-submarine patrol combat mission with Staple. They then proceeded to have an extended break, with the exception of one three-hour training mission on October 26th. It was during this six-day period that the plans for one of the most covert and dangerous operations of World War II would be put into action. On October 24, 1943, Lieutenant Colonel Heflin, commander of the 22nd Anti-Submarine Squadron, along with Major Robert Fish and a few other squadron leaders, were called into a top-secret meeting 
Bovington at Bovington Air Base, west of London. It was there they met with the upper echelon of the 8th Air Force, under the command of Brigadier General Ira C. Eaker. Also in attendance were several top-ranking officials of the U.S. Office of Strategic Services, or OSS, under the command of OSS Department Head William Donovan. And also, the OSS would eventually become known as the CIA. During this top secret meeting, briefings were underway to issue a new assignment to Lieutenant Colonel Heflin and his 22nd Squadron, along with the 4th. From this point forward, they were no longer needed for anti-submarine patrol, as those duties were to be assigned to the U.S. Navy and the 22nd and 4th were deactivated. In their place, they were handed a new directive and operating under the code name Carpet Baggers. On this mission, they were charged with the responsibility of parachuting saboteurs, intelligence agents, weapons and supplies to the French resistance and other resistance pockets deep into German occupied territory. And they would be operating as direct air command of the OSS while also working closely in conjunction with British intelligence officers of the Special Operations Executives, known as the SOE. Along with this assignment came the redesignation of the two squadrons. What was previously the 22nd and the 4th would become the 36th and the 406th squadrons. Lieutenant Colonel Heflin assumed command of the 406th, with Captain Robert Boone as his operations officer while Major Robert Fish would command the 36th Squadron, with Captain Rodman St. Clair acting as his operations officer. Both squadrons were then ordered to move operations to the Alkenberry Air Base and were attached to the 482nd Pathfinder Bomb Group, currently stationed at Alkenberry. With this new directive in place, the command returned to Dunkswell and orders were given to pilots and air crews to prepare for the mass movement of their aircraft to Alkenberry Air Base. Now, Sergeant Henry D. McMillan was taking one more step closer to that adventure he had signed up for back in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. However, this operation, as everyone could plainly see, could possibly be one of the most dangerous missions they had been assigned to up to this point in the war. Upon the return of Heflin, Fish and the rest of the commanders attending the top secret Dunkswell meeting, the carpetbagger mission was put into action and a flurry of activity began. The ground crew personnel began the immense task of reconfiguring the massive B-24 Liberators from anti-submarine bombers to stealth-like aircraft with the ability to fly low-level night missions without German radar detection enabling them to airdrop supplies and French resistance personnel to other resistance forces hiding out on the ground. There were many modifications that needed to be completed in a short period of time. Among these would be the removal of the lower gunner's ball turret compartment and leaving a hole in the belly of the plane approximately 44 inches in diameter. It was lined with a smooth metal and a plywood floor was made to cover the exit. There was also a handrail attached to the side of the exit area, along with two strong points for parachute static lines that deployed when the personnel or supplies were dropped from the Joe hole. The reason behind this moniker was the custom of calling secret agents or spies Joes, or in the case of female agents, Josephines. Other modification included removing the nose guns for better sight navigation since landmarks on the ground needed to be seen to guide the crews to their target drops. The aircraft were also painted black and black curtains were fitted in any windows that might emit light from internal equipment such as radios that could be seen by the enemy on the ground.
While all of this and many more modifications were being made by the ground crews in Alkenberry, on October 24, 1943, a select group of commanders, pilots, and air crews transferred for temporary duty to the Thamesford Royal Air Force Base in Bedfordshire, north of London. This was due to the fact that the Royal Air Force pilots had been flying these types of missions for quite some time. They were to team the Americans with the British for training in classrooms and in the air. The goal was to teach these new American carpetbagger air crews in the perilous techniques of flying 500 to 600 feet above ground level, which consisted of mountains and constantly changing terrain and in the black of the night. They also had to learn the methods of keeping the heavy aircraft aloft at extremely low airspeeds this would allow the supplies and secret agents, both men and women, to be parachuted from the bottom of the aircraft approximately 500 feet above ground level and land as close to their targets as possible. The first of the Americans to receive training from the Royal Air Force was Major Robert Fish, Lieutenant Sullivan, and an air crew under the command of Captain Robert Boone. They were instructed in techniques and then informed they would fly their first actual training mission on the moonlight periods of November and December. They used these moonlit nights to see their flight paths and target drops more clearly. As more Americans arrived in Thamesford in November, each pilot would fly two nighttime missions. As a co-pilot, with a member of the RAF in the pilot seat. These joint American and British exercises continued, and although they were considered training missions and not actual carpetbagger training missions, there were still a few American casualties. The first of these was Captain James E. Estes, who is pictured here as he received a medal from an anti-submarine mission he had flown out of Langley Field, Virginia back in early 1942 with the first Sea Search attack group, who had narrowly escaped death piloting his B-24 during one of his missions over the Bay of Biscay, still flying anti-submarine patrol with co-pilot Rodman St. Clair. This time, however, he was not so lucky. A few nights later, Lieutenant Gross, along with his Royal Air Force counterpart, went missing in action as well. It was due to the deaths of these crews very early in the month of November that Lieutenant Colonel Heflin gave the order that no more than one of his crews in leadership roles could fly any combat missions on the same night. Once the training in Thamesford with the Royal Air Force pilots was completed, the commanders, pilots, and crews returned to Alkenberry and began preparing for their new operation. A few command changes were put into place beforehand, however. On December 14, 1943, Eflin and Fish were upgraded and put in charge of the 482nd Pathfinder Bomb Group. Now, Lieutenant Colonel Heflin would be the top air executive officer for the carpetbagger operations, while Major Fish became the operations officer of the carpetbagger special project. To fill the squadron command void left by these two reassignments, the current operations officers under the command of Heflin and Fish were promoted. Captain Robert Boone would now assume command of the 406th, with Lieutenant Lyman Sanders as his operations officer and Captain St. Clair was promoted to commander of the 36th Squadron, with Captain Robert L. Williams assuming the role of his operations officer. With all the shuffling of command on the inside and the jockeying for desk positions, there was just as much change happening with the pilots and crews on the outside, all over the Alkenberry flight lines. And as a consequence of all this activity, Henry D. McMillan would also be affected as well. He had spent the entire year and earlier, flying and training with the pilot Wilmer Staples crew. Under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Heflin in Wilmington, North Carolina, with the 22nd Anti-Submarine Squadron. 
But now, as part of the Carpetbagger Squadron, crews were being split up and assigned to other aircraft. Although the majority of Major Staples' crew stayed together through most of the Carpetbagger missions in 1944, it was during December 1943 Henry D. began spending time and training with some of pilot Robert Williams' crew, even though Captain Williams had just been promoted to a desk job as operations officer under Captain St. Clair, who was in command of the 36th Squadron. This action, unfortunately, had cut Captain Williams' actual flight hours back drastically to the point of only logging approximately 40 hours of actual flight time in the month of December. But as Captain Williams continued his duties inside, out on the flight line, Henry D. began forming solid relationships with the crew, both professionally and personally. These crew members from the B-24 Liberator called the Slightly Dangerous included Glenn O. Wichner from South Dakota, Milton Remling from Texas, and tail gunner Eddie Rush from Georgia, to name a few. Henry D. began working with them to get the aircraft reconfigured for the new carpetbagger missions, enabling them to drop supplies and agents to French resistance forces deep behind enemy lines. And even though everyone involved knew these missions were going to be extremely hazardous, at the very least, they tried to keep their minds focused on the job at hand. Some of Pilot Williams' crew that Henry D. was currently working with had pictures they carried with them, and they were proud to show them to anyone who asked, like radio operator Glenn O. Wichner, shown here with his sister. and navigator Milton Remley, pictured here with his wife, Dorothy, on their wedding day. And tail gunner Eddie Rush with his wife, Monica. And even Captain Williams had a wife back home, as shown here in the front yard of their house in Kansas City. But as the aircraft reconfigurations were taking place outside, transforming them into the consolidated B-24D Liberators. Inside the command post, more changes were taking place as well, specifically regarding the newly redesigned 406th and 36th squadrons. While still assigned to the 482nd Pathfinder Bomb Group at this time, in mid-December, they were detached from the 1st Air Force Bomb Division and reassigned to the 8th Air Force and would become the only units of the 8th to be officially activated in the UK from scratch. Also, as the end of December approached, the first all-American crew that would make history flying the first American carpetbagger mission were being assembled on paper and command was set and preparing to make this momentous departure into the night sky. On January 4th, 1944. As that date approached, the crew for the mission had finally been decided upon. Listed here on the actual mission report flight plan, the historic carpetbagger crew, for all intents and purposes, was the Wilmer Staple crew and would be using his aircraft. There were a few exceptions, however. On this mission, Lieutenant Colonel Clifford Heflin would be the lead pilot, while Wilmer Staple would fly as co-pilot. And written in the bottom left was Henry D. McMillan's name. Although with the letters F slash LT preceding it, possibly designating him as flight lieutenant. Also, it was not unusual on these carpetbagger missions to see names written in, in certain areas on the mission reports as a last minute change in personnel for whatever reason. As was McMillan's name on the first mission flight plan and report. So finally, after years of training and service off the coast of Wilmington, North Carolina, 
flying missions with the 1st Air Force, 22nd Anti-Submarine Squadron. Henry D. McMillan, Jr. had rose quickly in rank, transferred to England, became a member of the mighty 8th Air Force, and was only a few weeks away from being one of the eight hand-picked crew members to fly the very first all-American carpetbagger mission in a newly reconfigured consolidated B-24D Liberator. At last, Henry D's spirit of adventure had placed him in a position to make history, and even better, to do it with some of the same crew and friends he had been flying with for over a year. This would be the first flight of many missions organized by the United States OSS Department and England's SOE Division that would take to the night sky and become one of the most covert missions of World War II. Henry D. McMillan and the rest of his crew would leave the runway in the dark of the night and provide much needed aid to vast pockets of the French resistance in hiding deep behind enemy lines. With less than a month remaining before this epic and dangerous first American carpetbagger flight would take to the night sky, Henry D. had time to reflect on his life and accomplishments. And to be a part of such a significant mission was a little overwhelming. Back in his hometown of Teachy, North Carolina, he did manage to carve out a decent living for himself in the jukebox business. But that paled in comparison to the immense undertaking he was preparing for now, all in service to his country. With a little time left before this scheduled January 4th flight, he took some time to write home to his mother and father. He couldn't disclose too much about his upcoming mission due to its classified top secret nature, but he did want to brag a little about the importance of the operation. Dear Mom and Dad, I hope everything is going well back home. I have been working really hard over the last few months in Alkenbury. There's been a lot of things going on around here, and it seems our mission is getting ready to change a lot in the beginning of the new year. We're not hunting for German U-boats anymore, that's for sure. But it is an important new mission. I can't say too much about it. It's real hush-hush around here but I think you and Dad would be proud. I hope this letter reaches you by Christmas, and I hope everyone has a merry one. I will try to do the same, but I wish I could spend it there. Well, don't worry about me. I'm doing fine. Not sure when I can write again. The beginning of the new year will be crazy with all the new stuff going on, but I will try to write again first chance I get. And maybe I can explain a little more about our new mission one day. Well, tell everyone hey for me. I love you both. Love, Henry D. Kiss the babies for me. And with that, Henry D. got back to work. He wasn't flying and training very often in the month of December. Reconfiguring the aircraft and working with a few fellows from the Williams crew took up most of his time but he did enjoy befriending some of the new guys. He knew some of the Williams crew from back in the Wilmington, North Carolina days when they were all flying with the 22nd Squadron. One of the guys in particular, Milton Remling, shown here with a few more of the Williams crew and also pictured here during a little target practice on the firing range, was a graduate of St. Mary's University and Purdue University. I'm Mike Immel. I am the son of Lieutenant Milton Reneling. I was born in San Antonio, Texas on June 24, 1943. What I know of my father was told to me by my mother, her parents, and her brother, who's Milton's contemporary, George. The Remlings came to Texas in early years of Texas history, and some became Texas Rangers, some became outlaws. 
and some became cowboys. He enlisted at Fort Sam Houston in Texas, and by May 1942, had gained his navigator's wings at Kelly Field in San Antonio with the rank of first lieutenant. He returned home to marry his sweetheart, but was soon assigned to the 46th Squadron of the 41st Bombardment Group. Uh, after being commissioned in the uh, Army Air Corps, Milton was sent to Alameda Naval Air Base in California, where he became part of the 46th Bomb Squadron under command of Clifford Heflin. He was then sent to Cherry Point, North Carolina, and then to Wilmington, North Carolina, to fly anti-submarine warfare against German U-boats in Torpedo Alley off the Carolina coasts. Mother told me there was a train to Cherry Point, and when we got there, she rented a room. Having no crib, I was slept in a drawer. Milton did see me when I was three months old before he was shipped off to England. They were on that year. But as the January 4th carpetbagger flight fast approached, Henry D. did manage to log a few hours of flight training on the 16th, 20th, and 22nd of December. He did not, however, log these hours with pilot staple as denoted in the column as local, where normally the pilot's name was listed in the previous months. So apparently, he was flying in training with various local pilots of the 406th and 36th squadrons around the base but thousands of miles away, back in the States, Henry D's family were going about their lives and preparing for the upcoming Christmas holiday. They all missed Henry D, and even though they were constantly worried about him and the war that could any day take his life, they wrote letters and tried to keep their spirits up, along with Henry D's, like this letter from Henry D's mom and dad. My dear Henry, your letter received last week. So glad to hear from you. We are so tickled over the news and do hope it will all be over in 1944. We are all well, but it stays so cloudy and rainy. I don't know when we will get the baby pictures to send. We'll do our best to get some soon. Did you get all of your Christmas things? Aunt Ben got some presents and money. She had a good time, but says she misses that Henry D. Be sure to write us often. We will try to keep them flying. Be good with love and best wishes. Your devoted mother. Dear HDM Jr., do write us each week. We write you each Sunday, so goodbye and write us just as often as you can. Then we know you are okay. Do you want us to send you anything? If you do, just tell us. Do hope you are well from Dad. But meanwhile, back on the base, the men were all trying to celebrate Christmas in their own way. On December 25th, most of the guys got together in various bars and pubs and exchanged gifts with some of the local children that always would hang around the base. One of Henry D's friends, Louis Peterson, wrote a letter home on December 26th 1943. Dear Flo, Charlotte, and Viv, I hope you all had a swell Christmas and that by this time you're getting my mail okay. It seems like the mail from the States gets over faster. By the way, write to my new address at the top of the page. We had a pretty good time over the weekend. Christmas Eve, after we came back from a flight, we had a few drinks at the club around our Christmas tree and had sort of a jam session with a set of drums and a bugle. Went to mass Christmas morning and then had a turkey dinner on the base. In the afternoon, the field was filled with kids invited out to our party. They sure had a good time. We got our present in that we didn't have to fly. In the afternoon, we went to town and had a tea at the hotel. The lounge was filled with RAF officers and wives and kids 
It sure made me homesick to be sitting by myself watching them all. Had a swell time, though. That is about the best meal you can get in England. When the pubs opened, a couple of other fellows and I made the rounds and proceeded to get half lit. We wound up at the Red Cross, singing carols and sliding down the banisters. We're all looking forward to next Christmas and perhaps a white one. I'll sign off for now. And please note the new address. Give my regards to all. Love to all. Lewis. As Lewis Peterson finished this letter on the morning of December 26, 1943, the Christmas present he had spoke of in his writing of not having to fly on Christmas Day was over. On the night of December 26, the Robert L. Williams crew was called into flight headquarters. The first carpetbagger missions were barely a week away and the high command thought it would be beneficial to exercise at least one more training flight and began to assemble it. Since Henry D. McMillan had already been assigned as a flight crew member on the very first carpetbagger mission due to fly out on January 4, 1944, with pilot Lieutenant Colonel Heflin and co-pilot Lieutenant Wilmer Staple, it seemed like a good idea for Henry D to receive one more flight training mission before the inaugural carpetbagger flight. Pilot Williams, who had been on administrative duty as operations officer for the 36th Bomb Squadron inside headquarters for most of December, was asked to pilot this nighttime training mission. The crew members joining him consisted mostly of his main crew, which included navigator Milton L. Remling, co-pilot Joseph W. Hanley, tail gunner Eddie P. Rush, radio operator Glenn O. Wichner, engineer Jesse A. Wallace, and for this training exercise, two more crew members were added, bombardier Lewis F. Peterson, and from the Lieutenant Wilmer Staple crew, Sergeant and Engineer Henry D. McMillan, Jr. As the crew prepared for their scheduled moonlight flight, the darkness slowly began to cover the airfield on the night of December 26, 1943. This one consolidated B-24 Liberator, formerly known by its nose art, the Slightly Dangerous, turned over each of its four thundering engines on the flight line. As the sound reverberated throughout the base, the heavy aircraft came to life. And being so close to the commencement of the first carpetbagger operation, this would be a serious training mission. It would be flying at dangerously low levels, approximately 600 feet above the ground, so navigation and total concentration was crucial. And even though the night sky was dark, a small amount of moonlight was still visible. With this, the heavy bomber began its slow and methodical taxi to the runway. And after a thorough flight check, proceeded with full throttles forward and took to the night sky on what should be a routine training mission that this group had flown many times before. And after reaching each checkpoint in their flight plan, which would possibly amount to eight hours or longer, their mission would then require them to proceed back to the airport before sunset on December 27, 1943. But as fate would have it, for the entire flight crew that left on that training mission, that sunset would never come, and they would never see another sunrise. Their B-24 Liberator, called Slightly Dangerous, crashed into an English mountainside known as Hameldown Tor, killing every crew member aboard. And in those early morning hours of December 27th, that spirit of adventure that Henry D. McMillan Jr. had lived for his entire life 
was finally extinguished in what seemed like a world away from the little town of Teachy, North Carolina. So instead of making history as part of the first official carpetbagger flight, on January 4, 1944, Henry D. made history as a casualty in the first all-American carpetbagger flight to lose his life in a carpetbagger training mission on December 27, 1943. I still remember when dad told us how saddened he was when his good friend was on the B-24 and was on a last minute training and crashed and killed Henry D. McMillan Jr. along with the rest of the crew. This all happened only four days before Henry D. was to fly out with my dad, Lieutenant Stable, and pilot Clifford Eflin. And I think my dad missed him for a very long time and thought about him throughout the rest of his life. A detail of men under the command of Captain Jesse Messer were sent from Alkenberry on December 28th to escort the bodies of the Williams crew from the Torquay Railway Station to the Brookwood Cemetery. The men were all buried and the burned out wreckage of the B-24 was cleared over the next 10 days. Henry D's family were still awaiting a Christmas reply, or at least a card, since they had sent Henry D. one in plenty of time for it to arrive before Christmas Day. Henry D.'s mom would check the mailbox every day in hopes of that letter, but it wasn't until January 26, 1944, that a Christmas card did arrive, but it wasn't from Henry D. It was her own card stamped with return to sender, along with the worst word she could have imagined, and had been dreading for years. It simply stated, killed. The shock rippled through the family like their worst nightmare had come true, along with the wives, sisters, and families of the rest of the Williams crew living throughout the United States. Captain Robert L. Williams was my grandmother's brother, making him my great uncle. We didn't know much about his military career other than that he'd been killed in a B-24 bomber crash on a mountainside in England. I was lucky enough to have a few stories passed down to me from my grandmother and my dad. We do know he did his flight training in Texas around the same time that Henry D. McMillan was training at Harlingen Gunnery School, also in Texas, which could be one and where they met. The one story that sticks out in my mind is about the creaking stairs at their house in Kansas City. Whenever he would come home, he would step on the stairs at their house in a certain way that made a creaking sound. When the night of the crash, my grandmother was laying in bed and she heard the creaking sound from the stairs. She got up, went out and looked and no one was there. Before she left, she looked up into the sky. She doesn't remember why she did, she just knew she wanted to. When she looked up, she saw her brother's face smiling down at her. The next day is when they found out that the crash happened. Meanwhile, back in Teachy, North Carolina, the local Wallace, North Carolina newspaper added a write-up about Henry D's untimely death in service to his country. And eventually, letters of condolences arrived at the McMillan family home address to his mom and dad from Rodman St. Clair. Dear Mr. and Mrs. McMillan, I am terribly sorry I haven't answered your letter before now, but I have been terribly busy. You asked about your son's personal effects. All of his effects were gathered up and sent to a central point to await disposition to his nearest of kin. You must be patient, as you can please understand how things in these matters take a considerable length of time. I realize that time and time alone is all that can heal the wounds of grief. 
I sincerely hope that the sting of your grief has somewhat subsided. I hope that someday I may visit you and we could talk at great lengths about Mac. Sincerely, R.A. St. Clair. My dear Mrs. Macmillan, I am writing this letter to you as an expression of personal sympathy in the sudden death of your son, Staff Sergeant Henry D. Macmillan, 36th Bombardment Squadron. He was well known and loved for his friendliness and fine spirit by officers and enlisted men alike. He is greatly missed, both officially and personally, by this entire group. We all know we have lost a sincere friend at the same time that we recognize your loss as being infinitely greater. You would be interested to know something of the funeral service held at Brookwood American National Cemetery, 1 p.m. Tuesday, January the 4th, 1944. A very large company of officers and enlisted men from our bombardment group attended. The service was conducted jointly by a Navy chaplain and myself. Special prayer was made in behalf of all the loved ones who mourned his death. The committal gun salute was fired and then the bugler played taps softly to climax a very impressive service with full military honors. An American flag draped the casket and the cemetery flag was lowered to half mass during the funeral service. Brookwood is a very beautiful spot in a quiet English setting of evergreens. I recognize the difficulty of attempting to bring words of condolence in such experiences as this. But if I may say even one word to lighten the burden, I shall be glad. After all is said and done, our one and only real source of comfort remains the Holy Scriptures. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, Ye believe in God, believe also in me. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth on me shall never die. Mrs. Macmillan, you will, I hope, feel free to write me if there's ever at any time anything I can do for you. Heaven's blessings upon you and yours. Sincerely yours, Willis A. Brown, Chaplain, Captain. Years later, when we're cleaning out my grandmother's basement, we found a small box. Wasn't sure what it was, but I was compelled to open it and see what it was. When I opened it up, I saw this flag folded up inside. I found a little card inside that said that this flag was draped over my great uncle's casket. I folded it up, presented it to my grandmother, and she instantly started crying. She knew exactly what it was. And at that point, she told me that she wanted me to have the flag so I can cherish it and I still have it displayed in my house so I could remember Robert Williams, my great uncle to this day. One of Henry D's friends and fellow crew member of this last minute training mission, Lieutenant Milton L. Remling, also received an obituary as well, back in his hometown of San Antonio, Texas. After the crash and his death, his wife received a letter of condolence, also from Unit Commander Rodman St. Clair. Dear Dorothy, it is with the deepest of regret that I write this letter. By now, the War Department has notified you of Milton's death, so it is now permissible for me to write to you. There are not enough words to express my heartfelt sympathy. Of all the men I have ever known, none loved life nor had so much for which to live, as did Milton. He loved his fellow flyers, his lovely family, and his work. I can't remember when Milton ever spoke crossly to anyone. He always had a word of kindness for everyone and everything. 
Milton was completely devoted to you and little Mike. The picture you sent him of yourself and Mike was his most prized possession. Milton loved to fly. He often remarked that if death should sting him, he hoped it would be in an airplane. We in this business never think of a fellow flyer who has gone down as being gone forever. But keep in mind the thought that he is on detached service and in time we will all again be flying on one another's wing in flyer's heaven. Milton left us on December 27, 1943 and was with Pinky and his old crew. Milton was buried at Brookwood Cemetery at Woking, England on January 4th, 1944. Please call on me for anything at all I might be able to do. God bless you and little Mike, and may he relieve you of your grief of your great loss. Most sincerely, Rod. In the fall of 1992, I was in England on a business trip, and a colleague of mine in Bristol asked me what I was going to do next, and I told him, Sandy, I'm going to go see the grave of my father in Cambridge. His secretary called ahead and told the staff of the American Cemetery in Cambridge, England, that Michael Gemmell, the son of Lieutenant Milton Remley, was coming to visit and honor his father, who was buried there. Upon my arrival, uh, I was welcomed by a committee and the staff, and there was cake, and there was punch, and the photographer, and I said, pray tell, what is this about? And he said, this is a ceremony of celebration and memory of Lieutenant Milton Remley and his son Michael. Just think of all of the American soldiers and sailors and Marines buried in the cemetery. Very few today have any blood relatives that are still alive. Most of the men and women who were buried here were never married, even less had children. It was a very emotional experience, and it made me proud to be the son of an American hero. Thank you. However, even after this tragic event, the carpetbagger missions continued to move forward when the first flight that Henry D. McMillan had been teamed with before his death flew out as scheduled on the moonlit night of January 4, 1944 from the Thamesford Airfield in England, and many more flights would follow. Unfortunately, this airfield was extremely small and not suitable for the task at hand. And after many complaints by commanding officer Clifford Heflin, a change had to be made. Also around this time, January of 1944, Lieutenant General James Doolittle was appointed commanding officer of the 8th Air Force in Europe and the Pacific Theater. He would eventually secure the Watton Airfield, but when Heflin took a look at the unsatisfactory conditions, he simply stated, we're not flying one damn mission out of this base not in this condition. Finally, in March of 1944, the 8th Air Force secured the RAF training base in Harrington to become the exclusive and permanent base for all the subsequent carpetbagger missions. It was big enough to handle all the squadron's B-24 Consolidated Liberators, and all the commanders and crews were finally satisfied with the accommodations. Also in March, once they were settled at Harrington, they were redesigned as the 801st Bombardment Group, heavy and provisional, with Heflin still acting as commanding officer. The bomb group would be redesignated once again in August 1944 as the 492nd Bombardment Group and remain the 492nd until the end of the carpetbagger missions. This extremely covert and top secret operation would continue to be a major component to victory in Europe and provided resistance 
and freedom fighters all over Europe with supplies, weapons, and spies to infiltrate the German high command until the end of the war. Even after the D-Day invasion, and as the Allied forces advanced closer to Berlin, the carpetbaggers added to their airborne responsibilities by dropping supplies to the Allied troops on the ground, deep behind enemy lines. Once, even dropping hundreds of gallons of gasoline to General Patton when his tanks had stalled due to the lack of fuel. In the end, several of Henry D. McMillan's commanders, pilots, crew members, and friends survived the war. Pilot Clifford Heflin and Robert Fish continued flying and made one of the most dangerous rescue missions of the operation. Ultimately, the overall success and contribution of Operation Carpetbagger to the Allied victory over Hitler's Nazi regime is undeniable. The men who flew and died on those treacherous nighttime missions, along with the French resistance fighters, both men and women, who parachuted from the bottom of those aircraft, barely 600 feet above the ground, and many being executed if they were captured, should be considered some of the bravest air crews to take to the sky. Due to the top secret nature of those missions, and the CIA's reluctance to make their missions a part of public record. For decades after the end of World War II, they are now finally getting the recognition they deserve. A few books have been written about the famous B-24 night flyers, and a museum display has finally been erected in their honor in England for all later generations to see. These were all brave men and women who laid so much on the altar of freedom and should never be forgotten. Operation Carpetbagger might have been one of the last known operations of the war, but its success will echo for an eternity. of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven, and we celebrate this holy Eucharist in memory of Staff Sergeant Henry D. McMillan from North Carolina, who passed away December the 27th, 1943, and all those of his crew who perished with him. May God grant to them eternal rest in the name of the Lord. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. This sand came from Omaha Beach. We use it to highlight the inscription. This is the memorial graveside service. The memory of Staff Sergeant Henry D. McMillan, Jr. We commend to Almighty God our brother, Henry D. McMillan. We commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. In memory of Henry D. McMillan, Jr., through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.